welcome everybody. I see so many wonderful familiar faces in the room, so thank you. And thank you for joining us for the 68th session of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. And to our event, Girls on Fire, the Gendered Outcomes of Burn Injuries. My name is Natalie Myers. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Research International. We're a global surgery nonprofit that works to build up surgical capacity for plastic and reconstructive surgery in low and middle income <coughs> countries. And you'll hear us referring shorthand to LMICs throughout the talk to represent that group of countries that we all work in. One of the UN's priority themes for the next two weeks, and I quote, is social protection systems, access to public services, and sustainable infrastructure for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Burn injuries unfortunately provide us a great example of how a lack of social protection for women ends up reverberating throughout the entire healthcare system and impacts communities at every level of society. For those of you who aren't thinking about global health every day, and many of us who are even, burns may not be the first topic that comes to mind when you think about women's health issues. I have to admit, even for myself working in global health for the last 15 years, when I think of women's health, I often think of maternal health. And I have to say that women are so much more than our reproductive organs. And while those things are incredibly important, especially in today's political climate, we want to expand the conversation about what is included in women's health. Burn injuries are incredibly prevalent globally. Every three seconds, someone requires medical attention due to a burn injury. And because 95% of fire-related deaths happen in LMICs, they've often been labeled a disease of poverty. For 40% of the world's population that still relies on open fires for cooking, heating, and a light source, women and children are more in harm's way because they're at home more. Women lose clothing that could include saris, scarves, shawls, head coverings, also present an additional flammable risk. Other common sources of burn injuries include electrical burns from haphazard wiring in electrical systems, as well as burns caused by chemicals and acid, which you'll hear about today. 80% of intentional burn injuries are perpetuated against women as an act of gender-based violence. There's so much more to say about burns, but you'll be hearing that from our incredible panelists. And if you would like to read more, I would refer you to a couple articles, yours truly, and a few of our panel members have written about the topic in Think Global Health. So please go ahead and look up those articles and learn more about this important topic. But now I'd like to turn your attention to show you how burn injuries are an example that highlight a host of gender disparities throughout the system. What you see here is what we call a social ecological model. And as you walk through each of these concentric circles, you'll end up seeing the interplay of burns and gender disparities. A burn injury affects some of the most vulnerable people within a society, as we've already talked about and they are the, among the leading cause of disability-adjusted life years, a term we use in measurement in public health to measure the loss of the equivalent of one year of full health. Many of these disabilities are, un, many people live with these disabilities for unnecessary lengths of time. One of our research partners in Nepal did a study where on average, people wait 18 years in order to get a burn contracture release. Often they delay in seeking presentation because of barriers associated with transportation, costs, distance, availability of specialized care, or not even knowing that there is a treatment that could help them. That's 18 years of unnecessary suffering. And we found in another study that those years of disability were found to add up to an economic loss of $11.7 billion in South Asia and $6.1 billion in Sub-Saharan Africa. By the time these patients, if they're lucky enough, do arrive at the hospital, they require longer and costlier stays, averaging 38 days for an acute burn and 11 days for a burn contracture. These hospital stays end up impacting the entire family. The caretaker is often a woman herself, 
may lose her income of her daily job going out on the roadside to sell vegetables, and or may be the one at home caring for others. <coughs> Unfortunately, many times when I travel, I meet siblings who've had to drop out of school as well in order to help pick up the slack in their family to bring home income or to take care of their sibling in the hospital. A burnt hand should not be a family's ruin. At the local community level, we continue to see inequity in access. People often are not able to get basic but necessary wound treatment, which again can contribute to unnecessarily, unnecessary lifelong deformities and unnecessary deaths. And when that patient, if they're lucky enough to reach the capital, which might have some of the specialized uh, technicians like and surgeons that you'll hear from today, many of those facilities still don't have adequately trained staff, the proper surgeons they need, equipment, supplies, or financial resources. For plastic and reconstructive surgeons who are the specialists needed to treat burn injuries, we, there's a massive shortage of providers. Globally, there's five billion people who lack access to safe, affordable, and timely surgical care. And those figures get worse when we start talking about specialist surgeons. In Zambia, for example, one of the countries that research works in, we support the only plastic surgeon in the entire country of, with a population of 20 million people. He's based in the capital. While in the US, we have one plastic surgeon for every 50,000 people. That's a 400 fold difference. And I think maybe in this room, we might have more plastic surgeons than many countries. <laughs> so it's a really dire situation. And of that global surgical workforce, only one third are women. With such a massive need for access to surgical care, we're never gonna close this gap if we rely only on the male half of the population to close it. Investments in health policy, training, and education are all necessary to make an impact on these taking place at every level. And international collaboration, the last of the circles, is where we find ourselves today. We built out this panel with this model in mind, thinking about bringing in perspectives from esteemed experts who can share insights into pathways for improvement within each of these circles. We strongly believe no person should have to suffer a preventable, treatable disability because of their geography, income, or gender. Thank you. And before we get to the good stuff, I did just want to quickly acknowledge our incredible all-women planning committee. <laughs> um, you've been great, and I just wanted to give a personal thanks. I know people flew in from Uganda, Colombia, took trains down, planes, um, and a special shout out to my personal support system, my husband and family who came in from California and Colorado. So just a quick thanks. It always takes a village, and it's even better when women are running it. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so let me introduce you to Laura Himmicky, a dear friend of mine, our moderator today, co-author, mentor, global health expert. She spent over 15 years of her life working in Francophone Africa. She serves as a consultant to the Gates Foundation, World Health Organization, World Bank, and the list goes on. And she's a public health professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> and just to echo, Natalie, thank you all for being here. We know there are many events going on this week, today, this time, so we're, we're really pleased that you chose to spend the next hour and a half with us. I'd like to just echo what Natalie said. In putting together this session, and actually researching the articles that she shared with you, we all learned a lot, but we also felt it was really important to focus on women, both as the survivors of burn care injuries, but also in many cases, the providers. So we're going to bring you both of those angles. Um, the numbers that Natalie shared are shocking. And yet we know that the data and cases, injuries are severely underreported. And as we often say in public health, if you don't count it, it doesn't count. So a lot more work needs to be done on data collection systems in general. We have an amazing panel and I will not be long, I promised you. Um, as Natalie said, we wanna really share that we acknowledge that part of women's health is sexual reproductive health, maternal health, but there's so much more. 
and gen women face gender disparities in accessing, accessing a wide range of health care, including as we're learning more about, more about surgical care and specifically reconstructive care for birds. Um, we, again, the numbers are shocking. And we hope that by the end of our panel discussion, with your participation too, that you'll join us. We hope that this discussion just begins to sort of ignite your passion and learning more about burn care, about women as survivors, women as providers. We're afraid with this great panel we have that we might run out of time. So I encourage you, there are some blue cards around the room. So you may wanna grab one or more now. If you think of a question, there's some in the back, there's some in the window sills. Um, to feel free and write down a question, we might not get to all of the audience questions. If you're willing to, you can put your name on your question, even your email and we'll make sure that one of our panelists or one of us gets back to you with that question. Again, we'd love for you all to join us as advocates. The umbrella is large and please join us under the umbrella. Um, so again, I'm not going to introduce each of the panelists individually because that would take a half an hour. They all have very impressive bios. So I'll do a, a short intro to each one. She will share some initial remarks and then hopefully we'll have time for some discussion and some of your questions. Um, so as they say, without further ado, it's my, really my pleasure to start with uh, Natalia Ponce de Leon. Um, Natalia is an acid attack burn survivor. And after having spent a short time with her today, I would say even thriver, following an acid attack in Colombia, Bogota, Colombia, where she lives. And she's the founder of the Natalia Ponce de Leon Fundacion. Um, and she'll, she'll share her story. I think she's better at sharing her story than I am. So over to you, Natalia. Thank you so much, Laura. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to being here. I present myself. Uh, when I am Natalia Ponce de Leon, I was born in Bogota, Colombia in August 8, 1980. And I want to share with you my testimony of reborn my life after my attack. 10 years ago, I would have never imagined I had to live a nightmare, be at the brink of the dead, fight against all odds to reborn and become an activist. Nor, I have never imagined to have the honor to be here to speak to you today. 10 years ago, I was at my mom's house and I received a call. Supposedly, my ex-boyfriend left me something for me at the door. I did not pay too much attention and when I went out to take out the garbage, I was surprised by a man in a hood and attacked me with a chemical substance. Immediately, I felt how my skin was burning. My clothes tear apart by the substance and I started losing my sight. Colombia is the country with the highest number of acid attacks against women a reality that was invisible until March 27, 2014, when a video of Natalia Ponce being attacked was broadcasted in all news channels. But she refused to become a victim. She became a fighter for victims' rights, recognizable by the mask she wore, convincing Congress to pass a law that gives 50-year sentences against aggressors. But the attacks continued and the aggressors were not being pursued. Now, she had to rally an entire country to make her fight their fight pressuring government to commit to this law and health institutions to provide for the right care. Natalia Ponce, hoy apareció sin máscara. In a massive press conference, Natalia took off her mask for the first time, handing it to the press, asking them to wear it so no other Colombian would. And the press did just that, kicking off a massive PR movement. The movement grew through a cross-media campaign, getting a flood of free press from social and traditional media, bringing the issue to light. 
motivating individuals, groups, and businesses to participate by wearing a mask through the website or an app. A direct mail was sent to government officials and healthcare leaders inviting them to put on the mask and to commit to Natalia's cause. And one by one, they did. From the first lady to mayors, congressmen, district attorneys, and doctors. The story of Natalia has changed things. The police is committed to create specialized squads to pursue acid attackers. Hospitals are committed to train their staff in acid attack care. Government is regulating acid sales just like gone sale is. Colombians wore a mask so no other Colombian woman would ever have to again. And you can find this video completely free. It's in YouTube. It's called The Last Mask. It's free and you can download and share with all your family and parents and everywhere. By the time I arrived to the hospital, 37% of my body was burned. My doctors were not sure if I was going to be blind or have muscle traumas for a lifetime. It was an environment of life, loneliness, doubt, and uncertainty. During my recovery, I had two options. The easy way, I could lie in a bed, feeling myself, up with hate and anger, or the hard way, standing up and making all this strategy something greater. And so I did. In a couple of weeks, I will complete 10 years from the day of my attack. That 27th of March, 2014, the day I ended the life I had planned and I started a new one the moment I died and I was reborn. Against all odds, I started a better life, a life with a mission, a life dedicated to a bigger purpose. I started to contact with other victims of acid attacks. Talking to them was a relief and really painful at the same time. It was relieving again what happened to, what happened to me. It required a lot of a strain. I would not have accomplished what I did if it was not by the strength, the mental strength. It was a mental strength, the effort, the effort to understand that the pain and suffering are transcendental. Courage is just a word if you don't have the strength to accomplish, to accomplish goals. Everything we, we get in life is a consequence of reaching our goals, big or small. That is subjective. My biggest goal at the beginning was getting out of bed like everyone else. Today, my biggest goal is to create a hospital unit for born victims of all kinds of born victims in Colombia. The most powerful tools we have our, our mind and it, and it is trained. It gives us the opportunity to earn further and richer higher. No one of our goals would have been accomplished without constancy. For me, constancy is the quality to maintain your strength regardless of circumstances. Constancy gives me through 40 surgeries five messages a day, no matter how painful they were, and the constant use of a mask that helped, me, that helped my skin get, get back to where it was supposed to be. I'm not a perfect human being. No one of us are. The beautiful thing about you, the beautiful thing about being a human being lies in the capacity of resilience and moving forward. In order to do that, it is important to leave the past behind. Forgiveness is what made me stand up and accept myself, my faith, and move along with it. I forgive with others around me that built me up and gave me conscience. conscience. Forgiveness and fight is the food to move forward. When you move forward, you know where you are heading, but you don't know where you will end. 
I created a foundation that, help be, that helps victims of ASC attack like mine. In 2016, the Colombian government passed a law under my name, enforcing the sentences for attackers with chemical substances. Today, I work hard to leave my country with the capacity of responding to these attacks all around the country. What will happen next? I don't know. But I trust that with the strength, constancy, and forgiveness, we will keep accomplishing new goals. My message to you today is to take these three worlds, make them yours, use them in order you want, the order doesn't don't affect the product. The outcome will be a new process to help each other and make our society better. As a woman, I feel moved by all the victims of this kind of attacks. Also, I feel moved to see that, to see that as a woman, we have developed our sense of resilience to its maximum. We have accomplished rights and innovations. In so many fields, women help their community to improve their life standards. It is our task to honor what others have accomplished for us, to acknowledge the privileged position we are in. We live now in a world with rights for everyone, because others have cleared this path for us with their own courage. We need to help, we need to help clear the path for a better future. Have the courage that no matter how tough, tough, how tough the situation are, we can reach for more. Not for me, but for you, but for the generations to come. We gather here today because it is our duty to keep working for those that haven't been born, but will, but will be soon. It is our task to keep the future bright. Thank you so much. Sorry for my English. Natalia, think less at perfecto. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, every time I hear your story, I moved again. Um, and this time it, it reminded me that the English word courage actually comes from the Latin and French word cœur, or in Spanish, corazón. So thank you for bringing your courage and su corazón uh, to, to this conversation today. Again, I feel like I could talk to you for hours, but so we have a wonderful panel and we'll come back to you. Um, I'm thrilled now to introduce you to Dr. Rose Alenio, who's a plastic and reconstructive surgeon in Uganda and East Africa. She's at the Kurudu Hospital Burn and Plastic Surgery Unit. And a little while ago, Dr. Rose shared with us that, um, that Uganda has a population of 50 million people, and she's one of 10 plastic surgeons offering care. She also shared that her hospital unit about so many of the burns are due to cooking fires and other things that Natalie talked about. She also shared something that surprised me that once, at least once a month, a woman comes in who's an acid attack survivor. So again, Rose has a lot on her plate. She's esteemed and well known as an excellent surgeon, not only in her country of Uganda, but throughout East Africa. Dr. Rose, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I prefer to stand here so that I'm loud enough. I'm from Uganda, a plastic and burn surgeon. Uh, we have um, one major burn center. Our population is actually 49 million. And we, are, off, five million. <laughs> <laughs> and we have 10 plastic surgeons. Two of us work in these burn units. And I'll start from where um, Natalia, Natalia started from. You know, we say about one almost every month, and sometimes it's very sad because these mothers are pregnant, and we have to decide what is going to happen. We live with their sad stories every day, dreams lost, and stigmatization of these patients. Our band, we didn't have a bands unit until 2008, 
when Inter plus Holland uh, started a bounce unit was really a blessing because these patients were always thrown at the corner of the world. Every year we treat about 450 to 500 bands patients and 75% are women and, and children. And like they said, home accident is the commonest cause because we still use fire and our dressings are a challenge to us. The mothers are not very quick, so they easily get burned. And the children, especially in the slums, in the cities, there's no area for cooking. It's a one room for the whole family. So they cook in corridors and children don't have where to play. So children less than five years are very high risk. And then there's epilepsy, which is fit. It's so much stigmatized that uh, the ladies will not, or their family will not say they have epilepsy. So they will get married, have children, and they still have to cook. Fire is a trigger factor, so she will fit, burn all the limbs, and she probably won't, she will not know until somebody comes around. And by the time they come to our center, usually it is the fifth burn, and they are brought because it's now severe. And the other is, of course, we've talked about the acid. Um, I think it's probably the same line in Colombia. They target the face so that the individual is blind. So you can imagine what happens to these ladies after. They lose their job, their life, and usually they are the ones that take care of the children. So when they are blind or blind, they can't take care of the children. So children suffer as well. And I think we have a good number that, because for us, we like to carry babies on our back, so the acid goes to the children as well. So our center is probably was the first burn center in our region of East Africa, where Uganda is. So we identify the gap that we have 10, that's a big number for others, like she mentioned, Malawi, there are no plastic surgeries. So we decided to start a training with COSEXA. COSEXA is a college for East and Southern Africa. And, uh, we have challenged to train this, so research came in to help us and we're very glad to provide training materials, textbooks, and things that we need to train. So I'm glad to be here and talk about this training. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose, and, and thanks for bringing us on a, on a very short journey to Uganda and to East Africa. And we'll look, hear more about your work in a few minutes. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you, to you Dr. Jean Moore, who's going to talk about burn care providers and surgeons like Dr. Rose, but also broader health workforce issues, and especially gender disparities that women face in the health workforce. Dr. Moore is the director of the Center for Health Workforce Studies at the University of Albany. So thank you for taking the train down, as you said, today and joining us today. Thank you. Rose, I still have your speech. You want me to finish it up? <laughs> I, I just have to tell you how humbling it is to be here and to listen to the accomplishments of uh, people who are so very dedicated. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I want to offer you some perspective from a health workforce researcher. So a little background. Um, the U.S. has had long-standing concerns about health disparities, um, and we consider those differences between population groups in burden of disease, mortality, life expectancy, access to care. Um, certain groups are considered to be um, at greater risk for these disparities, including racial ethnic minorities, the poor, rural populations, um, and the concern led to research about trying to understand what contributes to these disparities, what sorts of things we can do about it. And one of the things that was found was that racial ethnic diversity in the health workforce could actually reduce health disparities. And research suggests a number of different angles for this. One is patient-provider concordance 
that relationships that have more trust, better compliance, produce better outcomes. Um, health workforce diversity can also improve overall cultural competence of the health workforce and ultimately the healthcare delivery system. So researchers at my center, you know, took a deeper dive looking at racial ethnic diversity in, in the health workforce. Good news, improving diversity. Bad news, uneven progress. More diversity in low wage, entry level jobs, much less diversity in the more highly educated professions like medicine and dentistry. So we decided to take a closer look at gender diversity in the health professions. Um, both have been traditionally male dominated um, professions, but that was changing. Um, we're seeing an increase in the percentage of female physicians and dentists, and it's been rising steadily over the past decade. About 37% of U.S. dentists are women back in 2021 and 38% of uh, U.S. physicians. But we found variation by specialties. So in dentistry, more women were likely to be pediatric dentists, general dentists. In medicine, um, more women were found in obstetrics, pediatrics. They were the most gender diverse medical specialties. Surgical specialties are disproportionately male. Um, can you show the first slide? Ah, okay. So my center does something called resident exit survey. So New York has about 15,000 residents, fellows in training at any point in time. And once they complete training, we do a very brief survey about um, the job market, how easy or hard it is to find a job, whether they're going to stay in New York or not. The state is very interested in that. Um, and one of the things we, we tracked in, in this slide looks at um, the percentage of female physicians in different specialties. So the top blue one, primary care. Um, orange one in the middle, IM specialties. Uh, I'm sorry, internal medicine specialties. And the third one is surgical specialties. So it was very clear that women weren't entering surgical specialties in the same ways they were um, entering other um, specialties in medicine. So why not surgery? Um, honestly, we've not looked at that closely in terms of our research and in, in looking at the literature. Um, it seems that there may have been a time when women may have been actively discouraged from entering um, surgical uh, specialties. Um, there aren't as many in leadership positions, there are fewer role models, mentors, um, and clearly women are going to become an increasing part of the dental workforce, the medical workforce, so this is an opportunity to figure out what we can do to try to improve the situation. Um, does gender diversity matter? Yes. Um, we think that um, it has impacts on outcomes. Um, it has impacts on improving racial ethnic diversity, um, more likely to serve underserved populations. The last thing I want to leave you with is um, uh, the bad news, which is we've uncovered um, next um, gender pay gaps in um, uh, between men and women. Now this is from our resident exit survey and we uh, we started, we've been doing this survey for years and years, it goes back to 2001. And as more women enter medicine, the gap appears to be widening, the gap gets greater. Um, and you just kind of shake your head and say, what on earth is this? But nonetheless, it's there. Um, so I actually have, I brought copies of something for those of you who love research, um, a brief that we did that describes the methods, what we looked at, what we found, and how we arrived at that. Um, so again, and I will tell you that we, we revisited the numbers from a more recent survey and it's still about 33,000. It, it hasn't budged. Um, so I'm going to stop. I'm out of time here. But looking ahead, um, the, 
we need, and at this point, I think globally, a diverse health workforce to care for an increasingly diverse population. And we need to recognize and overcome the barriers to health workforce diversity because it's critical to achieving the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. That was a perfect sort of segue, I think, for our next speaker. I do want to remind you, if you have questions, please grab one of the blue note cards and write them. Um, if you're willing to, you can share your name and your email address. If we don't get to your question, we'll make sure it's answered. So where are the blue cards? So they didn't the back, back table. Okay. If you want to raise your hand, I can hand one to you as well. And I, we're okay. happy to pick them up. Just we're not likely to be able to get to everyone's questions. But we really do want to meet you. Um, now it's my delight to um, introduce you to my dear friend, Dr. Rupa Dodd, welcome Rupa, um, who's the executive director and co-founder of Women in Global Health. Um, and I, I loved it because I did look at the website once again this morning that you know Women in Global Health is more than an organization. And I know it's part of this movement, and I think a lot of us are part of this movement. Um, this movement that's really, and again, from your website, is a women-led movement demanding gender equality in global health. And I love the word demanding, too, because I think it's more of a, it's not, it's time, it's not time to politely ask, right? We, we really do need to demand uh, gender equity in global health, both for uh, survivors, of things like acid attacks and other burn injuries uh, for patients in general and for female providers and more female leadership in global health. So thanks, Rupa, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Thank Laura. You. I'm sure the podium. If you'd like, either way, it's fine. Okay. Um, well, thanks for such a warm welcome. And really, uh, I hope to welcome all of you this entire room, but you are women in global health from our point of view. Thanks for the courage, the leadership. Um, you know, I was asked to speak about why uh, identifying issues such as burn from a gender uh, equality responsive uh, aspect is needed. I don't think I need to make the case for that because the panel here has opened it up with exactly <coughs> why we must have uh, a gender equality approach and what we are saying, having gender lens being applied to burn uh, injuries. And particularly, the first aspect I want to really highlight is that we've heard about the risks, the patterns of disease and health-related behaviors that are influenced by biological sex, but are also driven by socially determined gender norms and roles. We've heard um, uh, the very powerful testimony of Natalia uh, of what has taken place and takes place for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of girls and women around the world. We cannot understand the prevalence and outcomes of burn injuries without understanding the gender determinants of health that drive different risks for women and men. As an example, women in some parts of the world are subject to deliberate burns as a form of gender-based violence and patriarchal control that men never or rarely experience. We heard the testimony of chemical burns. Some described as acid attacks are common in countries as diverse as Bangladesh, Jamaica, Taiwan, Colombia, Uganda, as we've heard. The majority of victims are women, and the vast majority of perpetrators are men who claim to be driven by rejection of a marriage proposal or marriage breakup. Similarly, the murder of brides by burning occurs throughout South Asia when it is alleged her family paid too little dowry. We cannot understand or prevent such deaths and injuries from burns without understanding the gender inequalities and subordinate position of women and girls that enable such violence. And that's why I was very touched by your story of going over legislative change. Second, research indicates notable gender disparities in burn in injuries, both in terms of prevalence and outcomes. Studies have shown that women tend to experience burns in domestic settings, often related to cooking or caregiving responsibilities, and again, a gender lens is critical to that prevention, as we heard from our uh, renowned surgeon from Uganda Rose. Third, evidence suggests that women may face unique challenges in accessing timely and appropriate burn care due to socioeconomic factors, culture norms, and gender-based discrimination. Women may experience higher levels of psychological distress and stigma 
body image uh, concerns following burn inju injuries compared to men, exacerbated by gender norms, and societal expectations regarding appearance and femininity. And fourth, these findings are based on scarce data as the gender distribution of burn is not considered um, and not reported in research. In the case of the murdered brides, um, burning is used deliberately as a form of murder, so it can be claimed that it was a cooking stove accident. Lack of data collection on burn inju injuries and lack of data collection um, uh, altogether um, disaggregated by gender is part of the wider systemic uh, discrimination where health systems are not gender responsive. So at Women in Global Health, we are calling and we are demanding for health systems to be gender responsive. Consider the gender norms, roles, and relations, and intentionally address the need to reduce inequalities. This results in developing effective strategies and more tailored approaches for burn prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, as well as for providing effective needs-based health services in general. And for instance, as we've heard, health providers need to be considered the unique psychosocial needs of male and female patients when designing interventions, in addition, addressing gender-specific risk factors such as occupational hazards um, for men and domestic exposures for women can really help prevent burn injuries in the first place. And finally, I'll say that this really also goes down to making sure that women are in equal levels of decision-making in all parts of health systems. We've heard the numbers, women make up 70% of the health and care workforce around the world. If you look at patient-facing roles, those are up to 90%, but decision-making over and over, there is a glass ceiling. 25% of leadership roles uh, are occupied women. That must change, and that means women at the community level must have the power to shape health systems that are for too long been designed by men, for men, to enable men. Health systems must be gender responsive, so all genders benefit from health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, walking here today from, from the bus station, I, I walked by the New York Public Library and I just had to share this quote because I wrote it down again um, from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Women belong <laughs> in all places where decisions are being made. I think, and, and all four of our panelists have probably sort of touched on that, that, that often women are excluded from decision making panels and positions and, and other positions of authority. So we have a few minutes for questions, and I don't know if the audience is coming up with some. I have many. I could talk to them for three hours, <laughs> like I said. Um, but maybe, Dr. Rose, I can start with you. Um, thank you for sharing. I know that, again, there's so much more to your story. But um, how do you feel like some of the injuries you talked about, and the fact that women, once they are injured from a burn, whether it's a cooking fire or an intentional burn, uh, you know, they also don't get care to the level that men do. Um, so, so how does this sort of reflect broader, as a symptom of broader social and economic factors in your country and culture and beyond? And if you'd like to use the microphone. Yes, please use the I think I have a loud voice, but if, if, if needed, I can turn it up, turn up my facilitator voice. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, if I go back to my country, as I mentioned, that uh, it's only one burn center and it's centered in the country. So if you get a burn 450 or 600 kilometers away, for, for the women it's a big challenge because she will be thinking first, how can I go? Who will care for the children? So they will take time until they feel so much pain. That's when they will access the treatment. And this treatment takes so long for burn. Sometimes they're in the hospital for three months. We've had uh, patients that have even taken one whole year in the hospital. And by the time we discharge them, they don't even know who they are, and they don't know where to, to start from. So I think that one of the things that is important is prevention, and we can have primary prevention where uh, the risk factors are reduced. They're not removed, but reduced, like she said, the law against acid, 
uh, targeted treatment of epilepsy, housing setup. There are quite so many things that we can do. And then there's secondary prevention so that they have better access. We may have a burnt unit, but it doesn't deliver 100% uh, uh, care. We have very high mortality, and this can only be reduced if the more centers of, of treatment is provided and also the care that we give is improved by better training as, and provision of equipment and things that we need. And then there's tertiary. We have very limited uh, rehabilitation for those that are burned. So you recover. Most of them probably will not have eyes. Uh, others will not have hands because it's all burnt. And then there's no rehabilitation. So we discharge them home and they just don't have where to start from. So I think that all this has to be looked into. Thank you. Have yes, well, again, we could go on forever. Thank you, Rose. Do people, do I need to choose the microphone? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Got it. I'll have to talk quietly. <laughs> Quiet for me. I'll use my insider voice. Uh, my inside voice. Thank you, Rose. And I know that one of the pieces that Natalie talked about that, that Rose, Natalie, and I co-authored for Think Global Health, uh, we told the story of a woman who was burned due to a cooking fire and blamed by her husband. Her husband took the kids away. She's never seen him again and spent more than a year in multiple surgical procedures. So again, these stories happen too often every day. Um, and Natalia, thank you again for sharing your story and thank you for your courage. Um, you, you really, I mean, like you shared, you could have gone different routes and you, you made that bold, conscious decision at some point to get out there and share your story. And not only that, share it over and over and over again. And as you shared you over lunch and, and even now, um, there's been so much inspiration that you've received and that you've given to so many other people. Um, there's a law named after you in Colombia. Um, how do you see really, in your country maybe, and, and more broadly, how do you see your courage and your efficacy and your story changing and improving the status of women? Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Bueno, first, uh, I want to say thank you so much to Physicians for Peace to bring me here because Physicians for Peace is really important in me rehabilitation. The transparent mask that I used in Colombia that is part of my rehabilitation. Physicians for Peace bring to Colombia this mask and I had a skin, an artificial skin, that thanks to Physicians for Peace, grand part of my body was, um, I had this skin under my, my, I forgot the name to say. Uh, Miss Injertos, <laughs> my, my skin dropped, and under my, my dropped, I have an uh, artificial skin that we are made now in Colombia. That is amazing because my story brings um, science and medicine to my country. And as a, as a survivor, I think <coughs> my first goal is to get out to this bed and to empower myself and to share my story with thousands of women and girls around the world to give this is empowered because it's possible to reborn every day. And to be visible, thousands of women in Colombia that before my attack was completely invisible. Too many stories completely uh, out of the, the line that nobody knows the situation in Colombia. <coughs> this is, I think, my first goal is to be visible too many women that are suffering for a long time in my country from these acid attacks. And but my second goal was to that the government pass this law. And I don't know, 
where I'm gonna finish, but I think this, not only my fight, this fight is for everyone because the situation that I lived that happened to me can happen tomorrow to your son, to your daughter, or can be your story, your own story. Because I think it's not only my fight, it's the fight for everyone around the world. Thank you, Natalia. Um, again, so many follow up questions. Um, maybe we'll just turn back a little bit to thinking about providers of care. And I know you've shared in your stories how many, how you appreciate the support you received from, you know, providers supported by physicians for peace and others. But um, again, without the provider part of the story, you know, women and, and others will never have access to this pretty sophisticated, in some cases, reconstructive surgery. I mean, the amount of training, and I've learned so much from, from Physicians for Peace, from the other sponsors of this, uh, this event, Research International, Smile Train, and the G4 Alliance, which is the Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetric Trauma and Anesthesia Care. I encourage you to look up all the sponsors. They're all amazing organizations doing amazing work. Um, from the kind of the provider perspective, and, and Jean, it was fascinating, or pretty shocking, or disturbing, I shouldn't say fascinating, to learn still about all those gender gaps with women who want to, first of all, become healthcare providers, and perhaps even think about or dream about becoming a surgeon or having some surgical skills. So given the data you found, how do you think we could better incentivize women, both in the U.S. and beyond, to consider pursuing their dreams of a surgical care specialty, whether it's as a medical doctor or another provider. Thanks, Lori. So I, I think one of the things, first and foremost, that we have to do is shine a light on this. Um, I, you know, as I was looking for literature, as I was looking for literature about um, uh, women, surgery, lack thereof, um, I didn't, I didn't find a whole lot, but what I did found, find appeared to be more focused on surgical journals. And I think we need to take a broader look. I think we need to find ways to build a pipeline into surgery for women. I think that it starts in medical school, maybe before medical school, uh, but create opportunities for exposures and a welcoming um, approach to this. I think that we need to create role models. We need, like Rose, um, we need leaders. We need peer mentoring. But we need to create some way to draw attention and encourage people who really think this is a good fit for them to pursue it. Um, and again, I, I think that the point about leadership and the need for women leaders, particularly in this area, is absolutely critical. Thank you, Jean. Yes, Rose. Uh, I just wanted to add something about when, when I trained to be a surgeon, there were only six female surgeons in my country. But since then, the number has increased because we have an organization, WISA, Women in Surgery, so we have webinars to try and, and, and show the young doctors that actually it's possible to be a surgeon and still be married and, <laughs> have children. and have children. So we try to do that and, and, and the number is really doubling. And you know, like last exams, most of the winners, we are female. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're an inspiration to many of those those women, Rose. Um, and it is interesting because there's never that question that a man can't become a surgeon and be married and have children, or often not. Um, Rupa, I think I'll turn it back over to you. And I see you kind of nodding and uh, with a lot of what's being said. Um, and again, you've you've been Women in Global Health has been such a support for this amazing journey over the last ten plus years. 12, 14? <laughs> yeah. Almost 10. We're Almost 10. Okay, about 10 that. years. And yeah. I can still remember it at the World Health Assembly, yeah, when you were just getting started. Um, so how? what can all of us in this room do really concretely 
to, to really support women in global health as a movement, you know, demanding that gender equi equity. And I know one of the statistics you talk about a lot is globally about 70% of healthcare providers are women, which we all know that. And, and there are informal providers of care as well as formal paid positions. Um, when you get to the leadership levels, the number, the percentage shrinks from 70% to 40% to 30%, you know, so there, there aren't enough, I would dare say, women leaders in public health and global health in most countries and around the world. So what are some concrete things we can all do? Thanks. I was nodding my head because I agreed very much with what's been said on this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm amongst women leaders, of course, I have to agree. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, I, I think there's there's so much that can be done, um, but it is about, uh, you know, women in global health, we use a movement model, collective action, and uh, Laura, you, you cited our, our website, we're demanding for that change, and it begins with bold, intentional actions, um, particularly when it comes to women's leadership in health. Uh, when I started Women in Global Health, I was in training myself, uh, internal medicine physician. I still practice at Georgetown University. Um, but it was exactly that question where I was looking in the hallways in my clinical training center and I was seeing women were delivering care. But who was getting celebrated, decorated, and promoted? Um, and often it's the hallways where you, you see photo after photo of, of the, the male chairs. Similarly, I was advocating as a youth um, at the World Health Assembly, um, similar building to the one that's across the street, um, the United Nations, again, it was male after male. And I wanted to be part of uh, the generation that would see a different reality and not just patiently wait for it, but demand for change. So bold, intentional change uh, begins by, you know, acknowledging that women actually, um, you know, face a bias, a major gender bias. Um, most women face a motherhood penalty, whether or not you have a child or plan to, um, you will be perceived as a carer. And that really impacts women in surgery more than any other uh, profession in amongst the, the physician specialties. Uh, but we also have to talk about the male bonus, right? It's a male benefit by be being perceived as that they will not be carers, that they will not be fathers, that they will not have any care responsibilities. And that must change. And, and I think it's about acknowledging that aspect. So some of the solutions we're putting forward, we call them bold, is having all female shortlists until you actually get um, to a place where you balance that historical injustice. So it's not that we're saying, you know, give uh, women that are not qualified. We're saying women are qualified, they have the expertise, but they face a bias. And we need to equalize that by using techniques that are proven, quota for affirmative action, or just all female shortlists. And we know that when we have women in leadership, it makes a difference. We've heard about the diversity um, evidence uh, you know, just presented here from the state of New York, but this evidence plays out over and over again. When you have health providers from physicians, nurses, midwives, community health workers, coming from those communities, especially women, it's gonna make a difference on the health outcomes. These health disparities we're talking about are gender disparities, but they're also coming with a broader intersectional lens. So it's not only about the right thing to do, it's about the smart thing to do, and that is the case that we make is that when women are in leadership, they invest back into their households, into their communities, in education. They also pass laws uh, addressing issues such as sexual harassment, rape, gender-based violence, broader women's health issues. So really getting power into the hands of women must be intentional and we must do it acknowledging that there are historical injustices that need to be equalized. I feel like every, every one of the panelist statements deserves a, a round of applause. <laughs> but my friends know I'm a clapper. <laughs> um, maybe just thinking back, Dr. Rose, I, t I saw you, I, again, I'll pick on you, because you were almost standing up and cheering when Rupa was talking. So maybe you could just reflect again back on what you shared as a leader, really one of the leaders, I would dare say, in the medical field in your country. You started to share that the numbers are starting to change in general. Do you feel like the policy and social environment is changing? 
so that women and as Rupa acknowledged, and men are able to be full people at the job and have parental leave and both take care of children and have a family and have a career in medicine and particular surgery. Thank you very much. You know, in my country, we had uh, policy in the medical school which would say, if you got pregnant, then you won't sit exams in, when you're doing surgery. So if you got pregnant, you had to stop and take over a year and then come back. And that was discouraging people from applying to that. So that changed, we just had to change it. <laughs> Many of, the, and, 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 and that helped a lot. And of course, the, there's also social thinking that to be a surgeon, you have to be physically very strong. I don't think I look that strong. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is how the society looked at it. And the other thing is also, I cannot be called a doctor. They will call me a nurse, even if I have a PhD. And a male nurse will be called a doctor. So all these uh, issues, and because we are very few, so and it was difficult to challenge these. So that, as that begins to change, and the more female get into surgery, the more it encourages others to do. Because we were all told you have to be a pediatrician, or if you want to be a surgeon, then you have to do cesarean section. So <laughs> it's all about children. So that is changing. It's slow, but it's changing. But we need to put in more effort, we need more mentors, and we need more support to keep it going. And that's why I like research, because they're quite surprising. Now we, I was the only female uh, plastic surgeon in East and Southern Africa region. But now, through research, we've got a big force <laughs> that is coming on. Thank you, Dr. Rose. And it is important to acknowledge the work of Research International and in supporting COSESCA, the College of Surgeons of East and Southern Africa. There's a lot of work going on. But again, more is needed, more resources are needed. I think really more attention to this is needed. I would dare say before I became a member of the board of directors of the G4 Alliance, I, I knew surgical care was important, but I didn't realize how important and how under-resourced basic surgical, obstetric, trauma, and anesthesia care are around the world. So again, one of our goals is that you all become allies and advocating for and even demanding more attention to this issue. Um, I'd like to share a question from the audience. And my dear friend Abby from the Bay Area Global Health <laughs> Alliance, I don't even see from here. But um, I think this is really great, and actually it can speak to all of us. Um, and, and really it's that, Natalia, we need more people like you. Uh, not to pick on you, but you know, who are really boldly willing to share your story, um, to inspire others, and to say, yes, this is, I'm just gonna do it. I'm going to be reborn, I'm going to, this is my new life, and I'm going to fully embrace it. I love the fact that before our panel discussion, Natalia and Rose started talking. Again, Colombia, Uganda, and they came up with a plan to have Natalia meet with some acid attack survivors in Uganda and sort of start to inspire them. So again, these kinds of meetings are so important because they can bring together. I mean, part of Abby's question was how can technology be used to, to bridge some of that divide? And I would say exactly the conversation you had a couple of hours ago, which is like, yeah, let's have Natalia on a Zoom call with the group in, in Uganda. And really just not only inspire them, but teach them how to advocate and how to advocate for policy change, for social change, et cetera. Um, so maybe just to start with you, um, and sorry, I'm trying to read this question. I did not put on my reading glasses. Um, does the panel in general have ideas about you know, really, how do we increase the visibility of burn injuries and the lack of, of care, especially for women? And I think that's a question for all of us. That's, that's the reason we organized this panel for today, just recognizing this is such an under, 
studied and under sort of valued aspect of care and of gender disparities in healthcare. So maybe Natalia, I'll start with you, but I think perhaps everyone might have something to say to that question. Yeah, I think it's for you as, you know, you've been such an inspiration. How do we continue to raise visibility globally in Colombia, globally about this problem and lack of access to care? Thank you. Continue inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> so I am a motivational speaker in Colombia. Um, I share my story um, to show the people that it's possible to reborn and to continue. At the beginning, it was difficult for me. And I think the most important is the forgiveness. When you forgive yourself, you'll be free. Because to hate and to be anger is to live in oppression. When I when I learn, no, because it's a long path. It's not like one day I wake up and I say I'm a happy woman. Yeah. I'm free and forgive. It's a long way. It has been 10 years to understand that to hate and the ego and to be angry is just kill ourselves, our soul. And I like to, to share my story because I forgive myself. It's, it's not, the forgiveness is not to forgive my attacker, my victim, the person who, who did that for me. I understood that forgiveness is when you forgive yourself and you give you to yourself the opportunity to be happy and to find a mission because everyone in this life has a mission. We have a mission, everyone, in this world. But it's important to understand that, that the forgiveness is to forgive our, ourself, to be free and to be happy, and I'm a happy woman. And uh, and this is important to well I want to go to Uganda and around the world to share my story and to empower the girls and the women to show that the silence we need to stop the silence the voice is really important and I think my voice is really important for that to show that the the girls and the women cannot be in silence. They need to speak out and loud because the gender-based violence affects everyone in the world, brings more poverty, more disequality. Because this this job and this work is not is not only our work, you know, it's not only the woman work, it's for everyone because it affects everyone in the world the situation of the gender-based violence in the world.